Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. This one is about Kotlin flows and maybe you've already heard about the concepts of cold and hot flows because that's exactly what this video will be about. If you haven't heard of that yet then congratulations you will also learn about that in this video. But you will not only learn about what a cold and a hot flow is you will also learn about the different types of flows we have in Kotlin which one is cold which one is hot in which scenario you should use a cold or a hot flow and how you can also take cold flows and make them hot and why you would want to do that in the first place. And if you're now completely confused about what I'm talking about, then definitely watch this video because afterwards you won't be anymore. So let's consider this little function in which we declare a flow. And the most common way to declare and create a flow in Kotlin is by using the flow builder. So we just have a flow builder. We declare the types of uh, the type of the emissions this flow can emit. So every single flow in Kotlin can have multiple emissions over a period of time. So in short, a flow is really nothing else than a suspend function that can emit multiple values over a period of time. While a normal suspend function can only return a single value. And when you return all of that function, it's over. A flow can just return multiple of these values. So for example, we say our flow emits integer values. And we can then say, okay, we emit maybe the one. Let's actually do this in a repeat block. We repeat this 10 times. In here, we emit the current index and then delay this for a second. And we might also want to add a print line statement here where we say we just emitted the value it. Let's now take this function, call it here in main activity, so we definitely execute it, close demo, and we launch it on our device. There we go. We take a look in logcat, select our emulator, and we see nothing. So even though we execute the function and we also declare our flow here, we don't see our print line statements. And that is already the very important characteristic of so-called cold flows. So whenever we talk about some type of reactive streams, then we talk about cold streams and hot streams. And this doesn't only apply to flows, but also to comparable reactive streams from other frameworks you might know. And flows that are created with this flow builder are so-called cold flows. What does that mean? A cold flow by default does nothing until there is at least one collector. And a collector of a flow is just a subscriber, an observer, just something that actively listens to this flow and its emissions. So how can we change this? Well, we can go down here and say, okay, we use our flow, we call on each so we can react to each emission or we don't even need this. Let's just do it super simple. And we just say flow that the launch in and we pass a coroutine scope, for example, global scope, which you should be very careful with in your real code, but it's just the, uh, the easiest scope to launch something in. So for demonstration purposes, that will be completely fine. If we now run this, so we actively launch this flow, which means it is collected. Then suddenly we will see emitted one, emitted two, emitted three. So we do see all of our emissions because now the code of our flow body actually triggers since there is an active observer, which is this launch in block. This might become a bit more clear and something uh, which is more common or a scenario you will see more commonly is that you have something like this, global scope.launch, and in here you call flow.collect. And then you could do something here with, uh, with the emissions printed here, for example. So this will now be a collector, an observer of this flow. And since at this point there is now an observer, this flow will also fire and the code will execute because it's a cold flow. But this really just as a very broad introduction, I want to show you a more real world scenario, which helps you to really understand what the difference between a cold and a hot flow is and why we need both of these sometimes. So you've now learned about these normal flows, but there are different types of flows. Another common type of flow are callback flows. Let's take a look in here. I have an observe location function, which also returns a flow, but that is constructed with this callback flow builder. And the callback flow builder is also a cold flow. So the resulting flow out of that is cold. This one is used to just uh, transform a callback, like this location callback, which triggers when a new location was tracked to transform that to a flow so that the flow emits a new location when it's available. And you can see I've already added a print line statement that also prints when this location callback triggered. So let's now switch to our location flow demo, which is a composable a little sample one that I've prepared, which requests the necessary permissions. We just need that on Android. Um, but the interesting part comes down here. We declare the flow, which is the result of this observe location function. And then we listen to that with this collect as state function. So this really just takes the flow emissions and converts them to compose state. Let's first of all, get rid of all these calls and make sure to call this composable here in our activity by saying um, flow, what did I call that? Location flow demo. And then take a look and lock it here. 
And what we will see is very similar to what I showed you as the very first thing in this video. We don't see anything, at least in regards to our flow. So even though we call this observe location function, which creates this callback flow, the location callback never triggers, even though we also call this request location updates function in this flow. But the reason is the same. This resulting flow is a cold flow. It won't do anything. It won't execute. It won't initiate tracking the location if there is no collector of that flow, if there is nothing that listens to these location updates. And that also very often makes sense because why should we constantly listen to the location of the user if we don't do anything with it, if we don't listen to it? So there are very valid use cases of such a code flow. But let's now see what happens if we uncomment this code again. So we have our location one and our location two, which are both retrieved from this flow we collected as compose state. And the initial values of the initial location is just null. And whenever each location updates, we print the location. So if we now relaunch this on my emulator, take a look in logcat, then what we see is we see location update one null and location update two is null. And then we do get two lines for location callback triggered. And then we get our two uh, changed locations and every few seconds we get these two lines again. What this effectively shows is again the behavior of cold flows because every single observer, every single collector of a cold flow gets its very own set of emissions. So in this case, both these calls here make up a single collector which collect the values from that flow and convert them to compose state. And we've seen that this location callback here was triggered twice. And the reason is that we have two collectors. So we also got two different distinct location callbacks that were registered here. So couldn't that be very inefficient that we just register multiple callbacks at different places that all want the same location, but where all still have their own callback? Yes, that is inefficient and that isn't ideal. And that is why we also have hot flows. So while with cold flows, the flow only triggers when there is an active collector, hot flows are the exact opposite. They don't care about the collectors. If they emit a value, then they will always emit a value, no matter if there is a collector or not. And if there are no collectors and a hot flow emits a value, then the value will just go to nowhere and it will be lost. And the two very popular hot flow variants we have in Kotlin are on the one hand shared flow and state flow. And I want to now demonstrate the behavior of each of these, so shared flows and state flows, and how you can take a cold flow, so the resulting flow here um, that comes from the callback flow, and how you can transform and convert that to a hot flow. Because there are two magic functions we can apply here. On the one hand, that is dot shear in. And you can see that takes a normal flow, this observe location function returns a normal flow, and the shearin function returns a shared flow. And as I've said, a shared flow is a hot flow. So it will emit values even if there is no collector. It doesn't care about the collectors. And with the shearin function, we can convert a cold flow to a hot flow. And if we do this and pass in a coroutine scope in which this uh, will be automatically launched, so you can see this shearin function will directly launch and collect the block here. So behind the scenes, this actually makes sure that there is just always a collector no matter what we do. And for that, we need a scope. Remember coroutine scope, we can pass this in here and sharing started will uh, will be used to determine when we will start this sharing. So when we start sharing emissions, you will see what this will actually result in. So here we could, for example, say sharing started that eagerly. So it will immediately start doing that. You can say sharing started lazily, which will start sharing the emissions when the first subscriber appears, the first collector appears, or we say while subscribed. So with that, we can say, okay, we only share emissions when there is an active subscriber. But let's say we want to use eagerly. So we immediately start fetching the user's location. And we then comment out all of that again. And we relaunch the app. And what we previously had with just this observe location function, well, then nothing happened because it was a cold flow, which doesn't execute without a collector. If we now take a look in Logcat, you will see that our location callback was triggered. And every few seconds it triggers again, even though there is no active collector of this resulting flow. But because we use share in with uh, sharing started eagerly, we transformed this location flow, this cold flow, to a hot flow, which will always just trigger and emit values, even if there is no active collector. And you will notice that if we now uncomment these lines again, where we previously got two locks per location update here, so this print line statement fired twice, since we had two collectors, this now doesn't happen anymore. So we do get the location updates here for every single state, but the location callback 
just triggers once now because we have a shared flow. So the emissions are also shared between collectors. There is one emission which will be sent to all collectors out there. So in the case of tracking locations, this is very useful because that way we only define the location callback once, but we are able to listen to these updates, to these uh, new locations from across our app technically. So from wherever we have access to this resulting shared flow. However, an important behavior of shared flow you have to know about is that emissions can be lost because if there is no collector, so if we don't collect these flows as state here and we do get uh, location updates since we start getting these immediately after calling shear in then these location updates will go to nowhere they will be lost there is no collector that can catch these and shared flow by default will also not apply any caching you can set it up that way to apply caching in certain scenarios and to have a buffer and and all that stuff but that's something you have to do and by default it just doesn't behave that way so let's lastly take a look at state flow State flow is also a hot flow, as I said, so it will emit values if there are no collectors. And the same way we can convert a cold flow to a hot flow with shear in, we can also say state in to convert that to a state flow. In addition to these two parameters, this also needs a third parameter, which is the initial value, since as the name state flow says, is it holds state. It caches the latest value. So the latest emission in this case, the latest location. And the initial value in this case will just be null. So just like we defined here. And if we relaunch this, then you will see the uh, behavior at first seems very similar to what we also had with the shared flow. So we do get our location updates. The callback just triggers once since the uh, state flow is also a, a hot flow. So the emissions are shared between uh, collectors. But the difference is really that uh, state flow will cache the latest result, the latest emission. So in this case, the latest location that was fetched. And even if there are no collectors, so if we would just um, call collect as state here at a later time, then the very first emission would just be the latest location that was fetched. And that is why state flow is just commonly used for uh, displaying UI state, since for the UI state, you only care about the very latest emission of a specific flow and not about all those past emissions that happened before. So all those past UI updates, but only really about the last state, which is used to just I'll represent the most up-to-date version of the UI. If you do care about all emissions, however, then you have to use a shared flow. So for example, if you want to show a snack bar based on a specific emission of a shared flow. Well, then snack bar events are usually events you don't want to just skip or where you just want to show the latest snack bar because snack bars could be completely independent of each other. So you also want to show all snack bars. So you do care about all those emissions that happened over a period of time. So in that case, better use a shared flow but if you just care about um, the latest value of something, so for example, what the current text of a text field is, then use state flow. Because in that case, you don't care about how the user got to that state. So in which order they type, which character, with how much delay, you don't care about that. You just care about the current value of the text field. And I think the names of these flows already communicate quite well which one you should use in which use case. So imagine you would have some kind of timer flow, which just emits a value every second. You use that to display some kind of stopwatch or whatever in your app. Well, if you then want to show two distinct stopwatches that are independent of each other, then you should use a cold flow because otherwise the emissions are shared and both of these stopwatches would receive the same time values. But if you have multiple stopwatch displays in your app, which all display the same time, the same shared emissions, then you should use a shared or a state flow. So in that case, rather a state flow. So you should definitely use a hot flow in that case. I hope this helped with this concept once and for all. In just a few days, I will actually launch a very, very extensive Kotlin Coroutines and Flows Masterclass, which will be a new premium course of mine in which I really deep dive into all those coroutine and flow topics. Because I know here on YouTube, you can easily get lost with uh, getting a clear structure on this topic, which is really complex if you dive into it. So in this year masterclass, you will really get that clear structure and be able to learn Kotlin coroutines and flows from the absolute beginning on to really mastering them, understanding all the internals. And so I really found this is one of the most important topics you can, you can face because I can't think of any app that does not involve any asynchronous programming in any way. And since this topic is also very important for tech interviews, it's very common that you get asked questions about coroutines, about the behavior of them, about flows, uh, which is just why I decided to make a very extensive course about that. We'll come out on Sunday, check this channel, I will make a dedicated video on that, covering all the details about the course. Other than that, thanks so much for watching, I wish you an amazing rest of your week, see you back in the next video, bye bye.